Welcome everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome everyone. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Oh Lord, the Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening thankful for life, thankful for the blessings. Uh, we pray that you be with Elder Paul Day as he brings to us the word. We pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit and we ask that uh, you be with us and that we may all, all may gain a blessing and that we all may uh, draw closer to you. We know that time is short and we need timely messages for these last days. So we ask that you be with us now and bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, we're going to share a song called Dear Lord, Guide Me to Someone. That's a Christian experience. We need to be able to witness to those, to those around us and not miss any opportunity. Someone, so I can share 
yes, Jesus is coming back. Amen. And there's, there's, I think we're the only church that teach that Jesus is our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. The sanctuary message. Yeah, making atonement at for us. I don't think any of the church teaches that. They don't understand that message, but it says my way is in the sanctuary. Yeah, they don't even know that message exists, some of them. True, and, that, and it's our job to share it. Amen. Welcome everyone, and we're happy to have uh, Elder Paul Day. He's going to bring another timely message for us. Welcome, the time is yours. Thank you very much, Arlene and Linda. It's, as I let me say again, it's a wonderful privilege to be here and to be able to speak um, on this particular platform, uh, Prayer Retreat Ministry. Thank you for your kind invitation. The title of the message today is Christianity and Faith. And it's part of a mini series which started yesterday and it ends on Friday. It's really uh, a nine part series, but um, we're just uh, dealing with, I think, six, six subjects um, in this mini series, which is entitled Being a Christian. Let's just bow our heads as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for our spared lives for the opportunity to meet with your people and to sit at your feet and to hear a word from you. What a blessing this is, Lord, to, to receive a message from you. We pray that as you speak to us, that we will be receptive of your word, that we will not only understand it, but that we will, by your grace, apply it to our lives. And so once again, Lord, may I decrease and may Jesus increase. In his name we pray. Amen. As I said, the overarching theme of this series of talks is being a Christian. And it is impossible to be a Christian, a true Christian, without faith. In fact, the Bible tells us, and I'm going to be sharing some slides with you so you can see the scripture references on screen. The Bible says, the Bible says in Hebrews, Hebrews 11 and verse 6, as I said, it is impossible to be a, a Christian, a true Christian without faith. As the Bible says in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, without faith, it is impossible, impossible to please him, God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is God, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so to please God, to find acceptance with him, you must exercise faith in him. The true Christian must, does exercise faith in God. Even if I were to ask, if I were to ask the the 2.38 billion people in the world who profess to be Christian, including those of you listening to this present presentation this evening. Do you have faith in God? Then I believe that 99.9%, if not all of you on this platform, would say, yes, they have faith in God. Do you have faith in God? In this presentation, we will be looking at this very important subject. And again, it's an opportunity for us who profess to be Christians 
to examine ourselves, to see if we truly have faith in God. Because the true Christian has faith, genuine faith in God. So and for those of you... Questions. And, for, right. and for those of you who may not... And for those of you who may not be Christians and who are just who are on the platform also listening to this message today, it's an opportunity for you to have a, a better understanding of the Christian faith. And if you have a question, I'm happy to take a question at the end. But yet, with all that I said, Jesus Christ the founder of the Christian faith, when on earth, made this profound statement about faith in Luke 18 and verse 8, when he said, Jesus said, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, when he comes back the second time, shall he find faith on the earth? Jesus is saying there are a lot of people out there who uh, out there saying, Lord, Lord, Matthew 7 and verse 21. However, when I come back to this earth a second time, will any of those professed Christians, the 2.38 billion Christians and the Christians on this platform this evening, Will I, will I find faith? Will any of you, will I, any of us who profess to be Christians have faith? To put it into context, what Jesus is saying in the statement in Luke 18 and verse 8, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? We are going to look at four key verses in that same chapter, Luke 18, on how Jesus says faith in God is demonstrated in the true Christian. The first of the four key verses is found in verse one of Luke, sorry, of, yes, of Luke chapter 18, where Jesus says, Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Or in plain English, the Christian should always pray and never give up. I want you to hold on to that thought while we, while we quickly look at how the Bible defines faith. In Hebrews 11 and verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Some people say that the reason they do not believe that God or Jesus exists or that the world was created is because there is no evidence. The irony is that these same people are willing to accept as fact the theory of evolution. They are willing to accept as fact the Big Bang, a cosmic explosion, that a cosmic explosion occurred 13.7 billion years ago, creating atoms from which evolved all life forms, even though it cannot be proven. People today are willing to accept as fact that mankind evolved from apes, even though evolutionists can only provide conjecture and no concrete evidence as to why apes are not evolving into humans today. To believe that this perfectly chemically balanced and designed world, which reproduces and sustains life came from a random explosion requires even more faith than the belief in creation. Believing in the Big Bang theory of evolution is the very same thing as believing that you can throw 
in the air, random pieces of wood as depicted in this picture here on the screen. And it is able by itself, by itself, without any kind of hand or intervention to form a perfectly constructed chair, as you see on the screen. I said that the belief in the Big Bang and the theory of evolution is the same as believing you can just throw up in the air those random pieces of wood and somehow miraculously, well, we don't believe in miracles, right? But somehow it just formed this chair. The fact is man chooses to believe what he wants to believe, and that's his right. And to say there is no God makes man feel he can think and do as he pleases without any accountability to a higher authority. However, the Bible teaches the very opposite in Second uh, Corinthians 5 and verse 10, where it says, for we must all whether you choose to believe in God or not, the Bible says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. And so therefore, Adolf Hitler who murdered and tortured the lives of over six million Jews based on his ideas of a superior, superior Aryan race, which stems from the theory of evolution, will one day have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for his beliefs and actions. And in Romans 1 and verse 20, reading from the New Living Translation of the Bible, it says, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. And so while the Bible says in Hebrews 11 and verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The Christian's faith is not a blind faith. I said even though the Bible says in Hebrews, even though the Bible says in Hebrews 11, 1, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The Christian's faith is not a blind faith. For if we look and want to see, then we can see God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine, divine nature all around us and in our own lives. And so, what is the Christian's faith. The Christian's faith is a total trust and belief in God that one, he created us, that he redeemed us from the curse of death through Jesus Christ and that he sustains us and that he will never leave us and that nothing is impossible for God to do in us and through us and that ultimately Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth to take us home. And so the true Christian faith has that confident and unmovable assurance in the things which God has stated and promised not yet seen. And so going back, going back to that key text, our first key text in in Luke 18 and verse 1, which says men ought always to pray and faint not. Or in plain English, as I said before, it reads, men should always pray and never 
give up. A Christian who has true faith never gives up on God, never gives up in believing that God can and will fulfill his promises. And what are some of God's promises? God has promised to protect us from all deadly diseases. In Psalms 91, uh, 9 and 11, it says here, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation, there shall, there shall no evil before thee, before thee. Neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy way. God has promised to save us, no matter how messed up we are, no matter how far we may have fallen. God is able to redeem us, to rescue us, to lift us up. In Hebrews 7.21, it says, wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for us. This is another promise of God. God has promised that his end time prophecies in the Bible will come to pass. In Habakkuk 2 and verse 3, it says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. God has promised to take care of us. Whatever happens in Philippians 4 and verse 1, it says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You see, the true Christian does not worry about tomorrow, for they have that confident assurance that tomorrow will take care of itself. A true Christian doesn't suffer from ulcers brought on by undue stress because they know that God is in control of their life and that nothing can affect them unless God allows it. And they know that providing they are walking in step with God and are faithful to his word, then whatever trials and tribulations they encounter, they are ultimately working together for their good. And though they walk, through the valley of the shadow of death, they will fear no evil. Though they know, for they know that God is with them and that his rod and his staff will comfort them. And so, and so, my friends, when others are worrying about economic recession, global warming, pandemics, the potential negative side effects of vaccines. When others are worrying about the consequences of Brexit and the next general election and redundancy and unemployment and paying the bills and keeping a roof over their heads. The true Christian, the true Christian remains calm amid the storm. We're talking about being a Christian. The true Christian remains calm amidst the storm, because they know that God is in control of the affairs of this world and that he sees and cares about whatever they are going through. They also know that nothing is impossible for God. For he who parted the Red Sea to deliver his people from the Egyptian army that was coming to slaughter them can deliver us from whatever predicament we might find ourselves in. And so the true Christian does not get despondent. Stop praying and give up when things are not quite working out as planned. And they do not become impatient and try to solve their problems on their own by compromising their faith or by engaging in dubious or underhand activities, which, if discovered, would bring them shame and reproach to the Christian name. You have so many professed Christians that are petrified 
by all the scare stories they read on social media. And they are worried about their personal data being used and people watching what they are writing and doing. And I always say, if you are living within the law and you are not sharing on social media personal information and messages that you don't want people to see, then why are you scared and trying to hide? Furthermore, if you have a passport, driving license, bank account, pay utility bills and have a smartphone, you are already on the grid and your activities are being monitored by the authorities for national security reasons, we are told. And so the only one, the only one who can miraculously protect our, our identity and keep us safe from, from any threat, whether imaginary or real, is the all-powerful and almighty God. And the Bible says in Romans 8, and verse 31, what shall we say? What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And in Psalms 18, 2 and 3, it says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower, I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. And so, the Christian should not have the same fears and worries that unbelieving people have. I'm talking about what it means to be a Christian and Christianity and faith. In the Bible, in Mark 4, 35 to 41, we are told, we are told the story of when Jesus and his disciples were in a small boat sailing across the lake. And Jesus went to the back of the boat and fell asleep. Some of us know the story. And while he was sleeping, a, a fierce storm arose and water started to fill up the boat. And the disciples became fearful and that they were going to be drowned, even though Jesus was with them in the vessel. And they woke Jesus up saying in verse 38, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And we are told, in the scriptures that Jesus spoke to the winds and calmed the storm. And then in verse 40 of Mark 4, Jesus said to them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Jesus was with his disciples. He was physically with them. As a Christian, I believe that Jesus is with me. He is here. He is with us. True Christians believe that Jesus is here with us. You might not be able to see him. But he is here. His spirit is here with us. Jesus was physically with his disciples, but when trouble came, the disciples became fearful. And note, Jesus didn't say they had little faith. He said they had no faith. When you see professed Christians today fearful of sickness and death, fearful of end time prophetic events in the Bible, fearful of persecution, fearful of ridicule, fearful of being isolated and alone, fearful of what other people will think and say and do if they stand up for justice and truth. And when you see professed Christians fearful in their own church, but they will be put out, disfellowshipped, 
excommunicated for speaking out against the corruption and apostasy that they see within. But this is a sign that they have, as Jesus says, no faith. And the Bible says, the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And if you cannot please God, then it is impossible to be saved. In 1 John 5 and verse 4, it says, whatsoever is born of God, overcome of the world. And this is the victory that overcome of the world, even our faith. You cannot overcome the world and temptation without faith in God and trusting in his word. The second key text that illustrates true Christian faith is found in Luke 18 and verse 17. Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. What Jesus is saying here is that for us to be saved into God's eternal kingdom, we must exercise faith in him. The same faith of an innocent child. I remember when my own children were young and they used to hang on every word that I said. If I told my son he had special shoes that could make him climb walls, he would believe me. I remember I promised my eldest daughter I would, when she was, uh, I don't know, a toddler, I'd buy her a little kitten. And I remember every day I'd come home from work, she would ask me, uh, when am I going to get the kitten? And even though I was reluctant, but because of her persistence, she was relentless, didn't give up. I finally gave in and bought her the kitten. And in the same God, way, God wants us to be persistent with our prayers and not give up until God responds to our request, which is a sign of faith in God. In Matthew 21 and verse 22, it says, And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. And I need to qualify this verse by reading uh, James 4 and verse 3, again from the New Living Translation. For clarity, it says, And even when you ask, you don't get it. Because your motives are wrong. You want, you want only what will give you pleasure. And so it is not in all cases that the reason God hasn't answered our prayers is because we lack faith. It could be that our motives for what we are asking God for is wrong or what we are asking for does not accord with God's word. But going back to the point, the faith of a true Christian is that faith we see demonstrated in an innocent child. They hang on their parents' every word and they have complete trust in them that they will do what they say. And this is the level of faith the true Christian will exercise in God. In James 1 and verse 6, Again, from the Living Translation, the New Living Translation, it says, but when you ask him, God, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Second the second key text that demonstrates, or the third rather, the third key text that demonstrates the true Christian faith is found in Luke 18 and verse 27. Jesus said, the things 
the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. In that same chapter, where Jesus said, when I come, will I find faith on the earth? Here he says in verse 27, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. You know, I have heard debates in my own church. And when someone starts talking about exercising, and these normally happen during our, you know, business meetings and, you know, and usually when we're discussing, you know, the church building plans or some other financial venture. And when somebody starts talking about exercising faith in God to resolve the issue or to find a solution to the problem that we're discussing, there are some people who are quick to shut them down when they start talking about exercising faith in God. And, and, and that person who shuts them down usually says that, you know, listen, I hear what you're saying about faith in God, but we live in a real world. I'm talking about discussions in the church among Christians who say they have faith in God. And when we start talking about solution to a problem is through exercising more faith or faith in God, they say, listen, I hear what you're saying, but you need to understand we live in a real world. In other words, what that person who is doing the shutting down and is saying that we live in a real world is saying is that with God, some things are impossible. We live in a real world. You need to understand that some things, I hear you talking about faith, but some things are impossible with God. And what they are also revealing is that they are not a true Christian, but rather a wolf in sheep clothing. Because a true Christian takes God at his word and they believe that nothing is impossible with God. Whatever the problem, the true Christian knows God has the solution. Although with human eyes we cannot see a way through, the Christian knows that God can make a way. I always say that God does not help us with the possible. I said that God does not help us with the possible. That is the things we can do for ourselves, but rather he delights in helping us with the impossible so that when the miracle occurs, we can clearly see that it is not by our might or power or funds. And so we can give all glory to God. God wants the glory. There might be some people listening who might be going through some problem in their life. It might be a health problem or a relationship problem or a marital problem or a family problem or domestic problem or an economic problem or problems at work or even a spiritual problem problem. Maybe you have been grappling with these problems for some time and you just cannot see how things are going to work out. The situation seems insurmountable, impossible. I want you to know today that these are the humanly impossible problems that God delights in resolving. Maybe you have been praying for some time and nothing is happening and you are struggling to believe anymore. But God is saying to us today, if your faith in me is true, then you will not give up. You will trust me like a little child and take me at my word. God wants us to believe in him, even when we cannot trace him.
For faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You might be wondering, why has God not answered my prayers? Why is God hanging me out to dry? Why am I being tested? The Bible gives us a beautiful answer. In James chapter 1, 2 to 4. Again, this is from the New Living Translation. It says, dear brothers and sisters. God is speaking to us today. It's, he says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to go grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. By faith, you have got to believe that whatever test and trial God is allowing to come your way, it is for a reason. And it is a part of God's plan to save you for eternity. My, my final key text, key text to reveal the true Christian faith is found in Luke 18 and verse 42. It says, And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight, thy faith hath saved thee. The true Christian knows that they are not saved by their works, but are saved, as Jesus says, by faith. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And this is a key lesson. For many Christians, whether consciously or unconsciously, believe that they are saved by their works rather than by faith. Hence the reason Jesus said in Luke 18 and verse 8, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. That faith, which is as small as a mustard seed, will he even find faith? Christians with faith as small as a mustard seed. Remember Jesus says if we have faith as small as a mustard seed, we will be able to move mountains. Today, many professed Christians and Christians who go to church believe that doing good works, going to church, holding an office, or taking an active part in church, keeping all the commandments like the rich young ruler, following whatever they are told to believe and do by the pastor or priest, saying prayers, giving tithes and offering, etc., are the things that pleases God and saves them. But this is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches clearly that we are saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves it is the gift of god not of works lest any man should boast the bible tells us as we read before but without faith it is impossible to please god it is faith genuine unmovable childlike faith in God that pleases God and forms the basis of our salvation. And when the Christian has genuine faith in God, it will be manifested by their unwavering faithfulness to him and, un and unrequited love for their fellow man. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for this message today, reminding us of what faith is and giving us an opportunity to examine ourselves, to see if we are truly in the faith and exercising that faith as described in your word. 
Lord, without faith, true faith, as expressed in your word, is it, it is impossible for us to please you. And if we cannot please you, then how can we be saved into your eternal kingdom? And so please, Lord, forgive us where we have been doubtful. Forgive us where we have not trusted you. Forgive us when we have run ahead of you. Forgive us when we have brought upon ourselves undue stress and worry. Forgive us, Lord, when we have acted like people who do not profess to be believers. Lord, give us that faith. That faith. Your faith. That unmovable, unshakable faith in you and in your word. And help us to live out that faith in our lives. From this day onwards. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. 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 I said at the end, if anybody had any questions, I I would I would endeavor to try and answer. I don't know if anybody's got any questions. If not, I'll hand over. Oh yes, we have a hand. Dorothy, you have a raised hand. Yes, good day. Good evening, everyone. I just wanted to ask. Um... What does it mean when scripture says that uh, each one is given a certain measure of faith? So what does it mean? Does it mean that why do we pray, Lord, increase my faith? So why do we have those, those scriptures speaking like that about faith? I believe each and every one of us are on, we have our own Christian journey to walk. And I wouldn't say all of us have the necessary the same level of faith. Um, we are here on this platform and we want more faith. We, you know, there are times when we may doubt. There are times when we may, we may run ahead of God. And that's because we don't have the faith. But, you know, we, we, we want our faith to grow. And to develop. And, you know, I think of Abraham. Abraham comes to my mind. You know, God promised Abraham that he would have a son when he was 75. But God didn't give him a son until he was 100 because he, God was testing his faith. And, and, and during those tests, um, his faith was, uh, you know, was, was being, was growing and being strengthened. And, and it's interesting, you know, that, you know, 25 years after that, God told him to um, uh, to go and sacrifice his son, and and this time he took his son, and he didn't he didn't even question God. He was just ready to sacrifice him, and then God said to him, "Stop! Now I know that you believe." So after all those years, God told him at seventy five you'd have a son, and it was only when he's one hundred, I think, twenty five, that God actually said to him, "Now I know." So, so, you know, God is merciful, he's patient with us, um, and he meets us where we're at. And all he's asking us is to, is to have that willingness, uh, that desire to want to grow in Christ and for our faith in him to be increased. And so we have, you know, messages like we've just had now, which is, uh, again, God reminding us and encouraging us regardless of what's going on in our lives, to put our faith and our trust in him. So yes, we all have a measure of faith, but God wants that faith to grow and to develop. And the more, it's just like, you know, we often use the analogy of going to the gym, you know, to build muscles, you know, unless we go to the gym and lift weights, unless we do it consistently and regularly, we, 
you know, we won't see the results. And it's the same thing uh, with faith. We, we, we have to keep exercising it and trusting in God, you know. And, you know, when different trials come our way, put our faith in God. And, and as God comes through for us, the next time the next trial comes, we will be stronger. Our faith will have grown. So, yes, we have a measure of faith. Uh, I hope, well, that's that's my answer. Um, we have Mum Mugabe. Mum Mugabe. Um, if you just mute yourself and uh, you can ask your question. Okay, um, I can't hear Mum. There's one in the uh, chat. Um, it could be... Uh... Oh yep. It's what then is presumptuous faith? And it's M M P M. What is presumptuous faith? I'm having trouble of muting. She has to just... I, I, well, I mean, I'll give you an illustration. I think if you, if you, if you climb to the top of a building, and uh, and you know, quote the text that, you know, you know, God will you know, not allow our foot to be dashed. I mean, we know that probably, you know, obviously applies, you, you, you know, uh, we're not, but that he will cause his angels to bear us up and we jump off the building. That's presumptuous. That's presumptuous faith, you know. Um, you know, you know, one God didn't tell us to do that. Um, and so that's presumption. Presumption is, yeah, when we, um, I, I mean, let's, you know, we put ourselves, it, 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 we we put ourselves in a predicament, and then uh, are expecting God to deliver us. I think that that's presumption. Saul, Saul in the Bible, for example, um, uh, Samuel said to him, "You know, wait for me to come uh, and sacrifice, uh, and you know, bef you know, you know, before you go to war." But um, Saul decided. That he couldn't wait. It was so Samuel was taking too long, and he thought it, it was delayed. So he felt that he couldn't wait any longer. He was nervous that probably the enemy might attack or whatever it, you know his concerns were. And so he ran ahead of God's command and went and sacrificed the animal. Um, and so that's presumption. He should have waited. When we don't wait on the Lord and we run ahead of Him, then that that is and then. You know, Saul, Saul, even though he, he disobeyed God, he expected God to still uh, bless him. That's presumption. When we when we disobey God and still expect God to bless us, that is presumption. OK, um, we've got desire here. OK, good evening. Mm -hmm. OK, I always hear about the faith that moves mountains. So mm. how do I have a faith that moves mountains? But I said, if we have In faith as small as a mustard seed, we can move mountains. You know, I was taught God, Christ was God. Jesus says, what is impossible with man is possible for God. Um, when we look in the scripture, you know, um, we can see how God, the various miracles that God performed, you know, he even, you know, um, stopped the sun. He parted the Red Sea. He 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 raised people from the dead. So nothing is impossible with God. And and we need to understand when when we exercise faith in God, what's impossible for us, God can realize in our life. Um, so that is the, and, and he wants us to, so, the, so the, the, the seed of faith is, is, you know, God is saying, you know, I mean, he describes, he said, even if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, because remember, it's the same God was saying, when I come back to this earth, will I find faith? Will there be anybody with any faith? But even if you had a faith as small as a mustard seed, you would be able to see the, the, the miraculous working of God in your life. Um, And so that's what it is. It's, it's, it's that that seed of faith is that unwavering trust in God. Even when you cannot see him, you trust him. It's that faith. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's the seed. You know, so, you know, 
we have to be faithful to God. So it might be at work. Let's just say, for example, let's give some practical examples. You know, we have bills to pay. We have children to feed. And um, you're at work or you go for a job. And uh, or you're at work and they say you have to work during Sabbath hours. Um, you know, you have to work late on a Friday after sunset. And, you know, you say to your you say to your manager, listen, you know, uh, I'm a Sabbath keeper. I explained before, you know, I can't stay. I know there are important things to be done, but this isn't essential work. And the manager turns around and says to you, well, listen, if you leave. OK. You're going to get a sack or don't come back next week. What do you do? You exercise the faith as small as a mustard seed. And you say what the free Hebrew boy says, even if I perish, I'm still not going to bow down. And you go and you remain faithful to God, knowing and trusting in God's word that he will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Because he said it, it is truth. It's as if God was physically in the room with you. Yeah, that's the thing. If Jesus was physically with you, standing with you, beside you, when your, when your boss said that to you, you wouldn't even care because you can see Jesus beside you. But because you cannot see, blessed are those that do not see, but yet believe that he is beside us. And he will work everything out for us. That's the seed, a small as a must, that's the faith as small as a mustard seed. Okay, anybody else? Okay, I think that's it. Um, uh, 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 Linda. Yes, thank you. Amen. Well, the a message to tonight and for the questions, it is faith. We need faith. If we don't have faith, we're lost. And we can only please God if we have faith. It's very serious, isn't it? Yeah. You know, we can talk about being a Christian, mm. but a, a, if you don't have faith, mm. it's impossible to please God. You cannot be a Christian. Mm. Faith is the key. It's, it's, it's the foundation of what we believe. Amen. Who we are. We'd like to thank um, Elder Paul Day for that timely message. We all need faith. We're, all going, to, we're going to end with a song about the faith of the Christians in the Bible, called By Faith. Wreck!
Are you able to close in prayer for us, please? Yes, let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much this evening for this time which you've given us. And we want to thank you for the way, for the word which you have sent through your main servant, Elder Paul Day. Thank you, Lord, for speaking through him. Thank you for reminding us that, Lord, without faith, it's impossible to please you. Lord, this evening we pray that you increase our faith in you. Lord, we pray also that we continue to trust you even in the small little things of, in our lives, Lord. And Lord, we know that in these days which we are living, the just, you have said that the just shall live by faith. Therefore, Lord, may you teach us to trust you with everything in our lives. For you hold tomorrow and you who holds tomorrow, we know that you have all the interest for us to be saved in your kingdom. And without faith, Lord, we will not be able to be saved in the kingdom. Therefore, Lord, as we have heard this message, may we live and exercise our faith, Lord. And you have warned us through the pain of inspiration that, Lord, those who have not exercised their faith, they are going to be able to do that in very difficult times. Therefore, Lord, as we live day to day. May we learn to live by faith as you have told us, Lord. Even if it doesn't look logical, Lord, because we know that you are God who wants to work through us to redeem us from this world. Thank you so much for the message which you have given us tonight. As we sleep, Lord, we ask for good night's sleep and also uh, good dreams, Lord. Let us dream of heavenly things, not things of this earth, Lord. And thank you for sending your angels faithfully every every night to guard over our homes and our neighborhood. We want to thank you, Lord, for protecting us from all the evils which, which may befall upon us. And you are preserving us for your heavenly kingdom. We are thankful and grateful. All these things I pray in, in the loving name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you for the prayer, Sister Kezia. And thank you again, um, Elder Paul Day, for the timely message. We must have faith. So tomorrow's programme at 4.45 is early morning prayers. And then at 5.30 is Desire of Ages. 12 o'clock with a midday prayer band and then 6.30 song service and followed by another tiny message from Elder Paul Day. So that is the lineup for tomorrow's programmes. Have a nice evening everyone and see you all later by God's grace. Bye, good night. Good night. Good night.